Hey everyone, welcome back to the Logan Cabinet Shop. Thanks for joining me for the third installment in the Hand Tools and Technique Sharpening Series. You know, for some reason, a lot of folks are apprehensive about sharpening their own saws. There seems to be this common misconception that you either need to have a PhD in astrophysics or be some kind of Zen master in order to be able to sharpen a saw. Well, fortunately, the rumors just aren't true. Really, it's no more difficult to learn to sharpen a saw than it is to learn to sharpen a chisel or a plain iron. All it takes is a small investment in a few simple tools and a few minutes of instruction and practice. So that's what we're going to talk about in today's episode. So first, let's get some basic saw terminology out of the way for anyone who may not be familiar with it. I've put a PDF of the next couple of screens on the blog post for this episode that you might find helpful to print out and make notes on as we go along. So feel free to download the file from the blog. For those of you who do know this stuff, please just bear with me for a couple of minutes as I don't want anyone watching this to be confused later on. I'm just going to focus on the toe end of the saw, so that's what's pictured here. Just keep in mind that the heel end of the saw is where the handle is and that the toe is the front or leading edge of the saw. The steel part of the saw itself is called the saw plate. Looking at the tooth line, the valleys between the teeth are called gullets, and the tip of the tooth is the point. One tooth is the distance from one gullet to the next adjacent gullet. Finally, some saws will have a nib on top of the toe, but I'll let you think about what the function for this controversial addition might be. With the basic terminology out of the way, let's move on to some specifics related to sharpening. The first term we need to understand is pitch. Pitch refers to the number and size of a saw's teeth. Pitch can be described in two ways. The first is points per inch, which is measured from point to point over the distance of an inch. The second way to describe pitch is in teeth per inch, which is measured from gullet to gullet over the distance of an inch. Typically, there will be one more point per inch than there are teeth per inch. For example, a saw with 12 points per inch will have 11 teeth per inch. It's important to know the pitch of your saw so that you can choose the correct size file for sharpening. There are plenty of references on the web to relate saw pitch to file size. The one provided here is from Pete Tarrant's Vintage Saws website. The next term we need to understand is the rake angle. Western saw teeth are filed with a triangular saw file with three equal faces. This means that the gullets and the resulting teeth will always have an included angle of 60 degrees. The rake angle describes the relationship of the front of the tooth with the tooth line of the saw. To understand the rake angle, first draw a line parallel to the tooth line of the saw, the red line indicated here. Next, draw a line perpendicular to the first line. Here it's in blue. The rake angle is defined as the angle between this perpendicular blue line and the front of the saw tooth. Rip saws typically have teeth with lower rake angles than crosscut saws. Saws with steeper or lower rake angles are typically more aggressive, meaning they'll cut faster, while saws with more relaxed or higher rake angles are usually easier to start but they'll saw slower. I found that for my own use, filing my rip saws with about 4 degrees of rake and my crosscut saws with about 15 degrees of rake gives my saws a good balance of speed and easy starting. If you're a less experienced sawyer, you might try adding a little bit more rake until you're more comfortable starting the saw. The final term we need to understand is the flame angle. I like to also refer to this as the bevel angle. I think it makes it easier to understand its purpose because it relates it more to a chisel or a plane. To illustrate what fleam is, let's compare some crosscut saw teeth with some rip saw teeth. Here we can see we have a crosscut saw with 15 degrees of rake on top and a rip saw with 8 degrees of rake on the bottom. But besides the rake angle, there's another difference between these two types of teeth. If we look at the crosscut teeth on top, they have bevels on them that turn them into small knives. The rip teeth on the bottom don't have these bevels. The bevels are fleam, and the angle of the bevel on those crosscut teeth is the fleam angle. The fleam angle is measured as the angle of the front of the tooth from perpendicular to the side of the saw plate. To better illustrate the fleam angle, we can view the saw teeth from above. Here, the rip saw is on top, 
with zero fleam, and the cross cut is on the bottom, which has 25 degrees of fleam. For a rip saw, the fleam angle is typically zero, or as close to zero as one can maintain when hand filing. For a cross cut saw with fleam, the higher the fleam angle, the smoother the cut will be, but the more fragile the edge will be and the quicker the saw will dull. The lower the fleam angle, the longer the saw will stay sharp, but the cut will be rougher as you're getting closer to a rip saw. As pictured here, for rip saws, we file perpendicular to the saw plate for a fleam angle of as close to zero as we can get. For cross cut saws, my preference is to file at about a 25 degree fleam angle. All right, with the terminology out of the way, let's get to some filing. Now I'm going to be using a saw vise later in the video, uh, but if you don't have one, it's really not a big deal. You don't need a saw vise in order to be able to sharpen your own saws. Um, a simple solution that I used for years before I got my first saw vise uh, is just to use a couple sticks. Um, you know, really just make sure that the two sticks are wider than half the thickness of your saw handle and you don't even have to take the saw handle off. And you just put the sticks on either side of the saw, expose just enough of the saw plate above the two sticks that will allow you to file and clamp the whole assembly into your bench vise. so that you can make any minor adjustments. Crank it down. And now you're ready to file without a dedicated saw vise. Okay, I'm going to use this rip saw to demonstrate. Not because it's any easier than filing a cross cut saw, really they're just about the same. Uh, but because it has big teeth and because it's really the only saw that's in my arsenal right now that needs sharpening. So, um, so this is what we're going to use to demonstrate with. Um, and the big teeth will help too later on when we do a close up of the teeth. So, uh, really there's anywhere from two to four steps when you're sharpening a saw. And it really depends on what kind of condition the saw is in, how many of those steps you're going to need to take. Um, so the first step is going to be jointing the saw. The purpose of jointing is to get all these teeth to be the same height. The second step would be shaping and rejointing the teeth. Um, now I would do this if I had a, a real beater saw that I picked up and the teeth were all misshapen and need to be reformed and you know if this saw was really destroyed and beat up um, I would have to go through a reshaping process. This saw has been sharpened many times and I take good care of it, so it's actually in good shape. So I'm not going to need to go through that shaping step. Um, but, you know, I'll talk about it after we do the joining uh, part. So after the shaping and the rejointing, we then set the teeth. Now again, this is something that may or may not need to be done when you do your saw. Um, if your saw has enough set in it and you don't need to do any reshaping, you're just touching up the sharpness, um, you may not need to reset these teeth. Uh, you don't necessarily need to set them every time you sharpen. Um, these teeth were not sh uh, set the last time that this saw was sharpened, so I will be setting these. Um, so the third step is setting, and then the fourth step is going to be actually doing the sharpening of these teeth. Um, there is a fifth step that is optional, and we'll talk about that once we get to uh, finishing up the sharpening. All right, so the first thing we want to do is joint these teeth. So what do we need to joint the teeth? Um, we need a file, a flat mill file. This could be any size, um, pretty much any cut. Now this is, a, uh, this is a bastard cut mill file. This is a six inch file. You can use a second cut file, a smooth cut file. It really doesn't matter. Um, a bastard cut file is going to cut a little quicker, a little more aggressively. A smooth cut file will be a little bit easier on the teeth. Um, the purpose of jointing, again, is to get all these teeth at the same height. We want to keep the file square to the saw plate. So when I do this, I just hold my file on top of a square block of wood. You can put a kerf in this block of wood with a table saw, with a plow plane, with a blade to actually, I'm sorry, the file to actually fit in. Um, I've never really found the need to do that. I just hold the file on top of the block, um, and that's always been enough for me. Um, 
to joint. Again, I keep the saw up above the saw plate. I'm going to hold the file flat to the saw, and I'm going to go from heel to toe. And I'm going to make a pass. And you'll see I'm putting my hand here towards the, this toe end to keep that some of the flex out. Now what I'm looking for is I want to file until I see a small flat on top of each tooth. Um, and with a saw that's been well cared for and, and well maintained, usually it only takes one or two passes in a file. Um, again, I'll do this one on this side so you can see it from the other angle. Again, the file held to the top of the block. The block keeps the file square to the blade. Heel to toe. One nice easy pass. Okay. Now, if you've got a saw that's in really bad shape and needs a lot of work, you may have to do this five, six, seven, ten, or fifteen times, maybe even more. Um, again, this saw has been well maintained, so. Um, you know, I pretty much have a flat on top of every one of these teeth. I'm going to give it one more pass. Okay, and that looks really good. Um, now, one note here. If you jointed it a few times and you notice you may have a tooth that still doesn't have a flat on it because it's below the other teeth, um, don't worry about it. A couple of teeth that are lower than the rest is not going to impact the performance of the saw. You want the majority of the teeth to be at the same height. If you've got one or two or three that are a little low, let it go. You'll eventually get to those on a, uh, a future sharpening. What you don't want is to have one or two or three teeth that are higher than all the rest. That will impact the saw. Okay, so here are those flats that I was talking about. Um, you can just kind of see here on the top of each tooth you can sort of see a very small flat so that's what the jointing does is it leaves you with a very small flat on the top of each tooth that you're then going to file away when you shape and or sharpen the saw All right. now with the teeth jointed the next thing we want to do is either shape um, and rejoint the teeth um, and what that's going to do is fix the shape of each tooth if they're badly misformed um, and then rejointing is going to get it ready for sharpening um, or, if in the case of this saw, your teeth are already in good shape, they don't need to be reshaped, they just need to be sharpened, um, we can go right to uh, the, uh, the setting and the sharpening. So, um, what I want to show you first is um, just a, a small guide block that I use um, to hold my rake angle when I'm doing the filing. So if I was going to reshape these teeth, the next thing I would do would be to file them and get them all approximately the same shape and the, and the same height before I set them. Um, this is just a very simple guide block. Um, and I write, you know, which saw it's for and what the rake angle is on top of the guide block. And what this does is it helps me to get the rake angle of my file right, so I'm filing these teeth with approximately the same rake angle. Again, it doesn't need to be exact. A little variation is not going to make a lot of difference in how the saw performs. So what we do is we drill a hole in the center of a guide block, um, and tangent to that hole, we, we make a line. Um, now on this side you can see the handle points to the right, so the rake is leaning towards the handle. So this one is four degrees towards the handle. On the opposite side, we're going to do the mirror image. So again, tangent on the other side of the hole, four degrees leaning towards the handle. And that's because as we file this, we're going to file alternating teeth, then we're going to flip this saw around, flip the guide block around, and file the other teeth that weren't filed the first time around. But since we don't need to reshape these teeth, we're going to go straight into setting. Okay, now with the teeth shaped properly, you know, whether the saw is already in good shape or whether the teeth had to be reshaped, um, the next thing we want to get to is the actual sh uh, setting of the teeth. Uh, now the set refers to the bend in each tooth. Now these 
teeth are alternately bent to one side of the saw plate or the other. And what this does is it makes the kerf left by these teeth slightly wider than the saw plate itself and prevents the saw from binding in the cut. The easiest way to get that bend in each of those tooth is with a, a plier type saw set like this. Um, and there are a lot of different models out there. Just get one, you know, that's well made. Um, I like this one because it has um, a, two plungers. The first one grabs the saw plate before the setting anvil actually sets um, the tooth. Um, there's an anvil on here that has different depths of set. Um, I've set it up so that I'm putting the maximum amount of bend in this particular saw. Um, because this is a rough ripping saw, I use this for some pretty aggressive rips and some pretty heavy stock. Anything from, you know, uh, 8 and 12 quarter uh, pine, poplar. Um, so, you know, th this is being used for some, some heavy stock. So I put a pretty aggressive set on this. Um, and the one thing to keep in mind is if you're working with a saw that has already been set previously, when you reset these teeth, make sure that you are setting them in the same direction that they were originally set. If a tooth was set this way and you try and set it back the other way, you're just about guaranteed to break that tooth off. So once a tooth is set in a particular direction, continue to set it that way to avoid breaking that tooth off. Okay, so now you can see how these teeth were originally set in alternating directions. Um, what I'm trying to do here is to set the teeth just about the top third or half of the tooth. So I set up the saw set, I set the anvil to the setting that I want, and I set the height so that the top plunger, you can see there, is only pushing on maybe the top half or top third of the tooth and I'm going to squeeze the, the pliers very gently which is going to push the tooth against that anvil. And I'm doing this slowly and easily. I'm not jerking and setting real hard because if I set these teeth really hard um, I take the chance of breaking one off. So I'm working my way down and I'm only setting the teeth that are currently set away from me. Once I get to the end then I'll turn the saw around and do the other teeth. Alright, now with the saw set, we want to get ready to do the final filing. Um, and I mentioned this block before, but I'm actually going to use it now, so um, I'll talk about it a little more. So again, this angle is my rake angle drawn at 4 degrees. So my goal is to get the side of this file lined up with that 4 degree line. And that is what helps me to keep that rake angle. So I'm going to line the file up with that line. And the hole helps with this. And then I'm going to put the file, I'm going to tap the file down into the guide block. is the side of this file is lined up with that four degree rake angle. Now all I need to do is keep this block as level as I can by eye as I file and that is what helps me get that four degree rake angle that I'm after. Okay, so when we're filing, as I mentioned, because this is a rip saw, we're filing straight across. Were this to be a cross cut saw, I'd only do one thing differently. I would use this flame angle guide which has a 25 degree kerf cut in both sides and I would place it on top of the saw so that it would point towards the toe. And instead of filing straight across like I would for a rip saw, I would file parallel with this flame angle guide. And I could move it up and down the saw as I needed to help me maintain an approximate 25 degree fleam. But again, because this is a rip saw, we're not going to do that. We're just going to file straight across. Now, don't be too concerned about getting these angles 100% perfectly accurate. Um, the little 
you know, little differences from tooth to tooth are really what make a hand filed saw cut so well and feel so smooth in the cut. So don't be that concerned that you're not getting it perfect. It's really not that big of a deal. So again, what I'm looking at is the, the flat on the top of these teeth. So I'm filing the teeth that are bent away from me. So this tooth is bent away from me, so I want to file the front of that tooth. And I'm going to make one light pass. And what I'm looking for is that the flats on this tooth, on the two teeth that the file is filing, because it's filing two teeth at the same time, I want to see that they're about halfway gone. And then I'll move to the next tooth. Now in this case, it looks like I'm really only needing like one to two strokes per tooth here. So I'll make a pass and I'll move down because I'm taking more off of the back of this tooth than I am the front of this tooth. Um, so I'll wait to file um, this tooth anymore until I turn the saw around. So again, I'm going to work my way down. One or two files on each. Just the teeth that are set, again, the front of the teeth that are set away from me. And I continue doing this from the heel all the way to the toe, filing every other tooth, only the, tooth that are, the teeth that are set away from me. Then I'm going to flip the saw around and do just the opposite. Um, I'll do the opposite teeth and I'm going to flip the saw guide around as well when I get to that point. Okay, I finished filing in the first direction and I flipped the saw around. Um, the one thing you want to make sure that you do once you flip that saw is to flip your guide block. Remember, your handle is now on the other side, so you need to change the angle of that file so that the angle the right angle is again leaning towards the handle. Now just again file the teeth set away from you which are the teeth that are weren't filed the first time around. Okay, with my guide block flipped I can continue to, to file and one uh, tip that I will give you is to try and keep the saw as low in the saw vise as you can um, what this does is it prevents as much vibration as you possibly can and uh, makes the saw cut rather than vibrate and chatter. Uh, and this time around, since we already filed in one direction, going back in the other direction now, we're going to file just until the flat on each of the teeth disappears. As soon as that flat disappears, do not file any farther. You're done. Okay, once all the teeth are filed and sharpened, um, there's one fifth step that is optional. Some people like to do it, some people don't. Um, I do like to do it. It's called side jointing um, or stoning um, where I run a hard Arkansas stone once or twice down each side of the teeth just to remove the filing burrs. Um, again, this is an optional step. Not everyone agrees that it needs to be done or should be done. Um, you know, so I recommend you just try it for yourself and then file a saw and don't do it. And, you know, see if you notice a difference uh, you know, and, and if it makes any difference to you. So again, all I do, put the saw on the bench. Um, the handle is hanging over so that the plate is laying flat. And I go from heel to toe. One pass. Flip it. And one pass on this side. And that's it. Now, one way, um, common way to tell if your saw is sharp is to sort of drag it across your palm. And if it catches the skin of your palm, like this one does, um, then the theory is that that's sharp enough to do good work with. Of course, as convincing as the test on the palm of the hand sounds, there's certainly nothing like just taking the saw and making a cut with it to really prove that it's sharp enough for you. So I've taken one of my marking gauges and made a line parallel to the edge of this board. And we'll go ahead and make a cut.
running straight and I'm getting about an inch and a half to two inches on each stroke. Can't ask for much more than that. So just one final note for this episode. Uh, a common practice for folks just trying to learn to sharpen saws is to go out and buy a, you know, a couple of beater hand saws to try and tune up and use. And uh, While this sounds like it makes a lot of sense, sometimes it can set you up for failure. Uh, quite often saws that you find in flea markets and in yard sales are pretty beat up. The teeth are probably broken or sharpened improperly, misshapen. Um, and it can really make for a hard time learning to just sharpen a saw. You know, to me, retoothing a saw is a lot different and, and takes a little bit more time to learn than just sharpening a saw. Um, so really, in my opinion, the best way to learn to sharpen a saw is to go ahead and try it on your premium saws. You know, if you've got a, a Wenzloff or a, a Lee Valley saw or a Lee Nielsen saw, Go ahead and try to sharpen it. The benefit of trying to do your sharpening on one of those saws is that the teeth are already properly shaped and they have been sharpened previously properly. So you don't have to worry about teeth that aren't necessarily shaped right or necessarily the same height. Join it once or twice just to level them out and go ahead and sharpen it. You're going to be removing such a little amount of steel from that saw plate that really you're going to have a hard time completely destroying it. And if you mess it up, join it down and try it again. So I hope I've convinced you today that it's really not that difficult to sharpen a saw. And I hope you'll go out to your shop and try it for yourself. We'll see you next time.